So this is going to be the last message in this series we've been in the last couple months titled The Way of Jesus. And I hope this series has been helpful for you. Uh, and just a reminder, if we're going to claim to follow Jesus, there's a way that we need to live. That following Christ isn't just theory and knowledge. It impacts our everyday lives, how we make decisions, how we treat people, how we use our time. And I believe actually the message today is going to speak into some of the current realities with our church ending this month. And I know this is not easy. It's sad. It's difficult. But there is opportunity for us to practice the way of Jesus. And my hope for us is that no matter where the future takes us, each one of us will stay true and committed to following Christ, to live out the fullness of this good life with God at the center, to love God, to love people. That's my hope for each one of us. In the days ahead, we would not give up. We would not hold back. We would press on to follow Jesus in everything, to live the way of Jesus. So this morning, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26. So if you have your Bible, turn with me. I'll give you a moment to get there. Matthew 26. <clears throat> and we're going to start up in verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. So I'll be the first to admit, in my familiarity with stories like this in the Bible, it's so easy to miss and really embrace the weight of what's going on. For most of us, we've heard this story before, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know it. It's not new for us. But familiarity can breed a sense of indifference and complacency in life and when it comes to God's word. So I want to invite us to try our best to set that aside right now. Holy Spirit, help us right now to not be indifferent to the word of God, apathetic to what happened in this important moment in Scripture. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the second person of the triune God, Jesus, the Word made flesh, Jesus in his humanity is suffering terribly here. And in his suffering, he seeks a quiet place to pray. He's trying to pray through all that he's feeling and experiencing in this moment. Because Jesus knows what is ahead of him. He knows the mission. He knows what's coming with the cross. He is aware of the game plan from the Father, but to execute that game plan, 
is going to demand so much from him. It's going to demand his very life. And all this is weighing on Jesus. He's feeling the incredible burden of what lies ahead. Verse 37, 38. He took Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. It says that Jesus is sorrowful. He's troubled. Yes, Jesus in his humanity feels like we do. And he doesn't pretend everything is okay. Jesus doesn't hide it. In fact, he tells his three disciples who are with him in this moment, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And we can't gloss over these words here. Jesus is experiencing sorrow to the level where he feels like it's going to kill him. It is that deep. And maybe you can relate. Maybe you've experienced a season of intense grief and loss. Maybe you've had times where you felt like, like the sorrow was just suffocating the life out of you. And this is where Jesus is at in this moment. He's overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. So in Luke's account of the Garden of Gethsemane, it says this, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Sweating blood. Now, skeptics might point to this and say, well, sweating blood, this can't be true. See, the Bible is full of errors, and this is one of them. Now, I'm not a physician. But I can easily do a search online, just like you can, and you can find out that sweating blood is a confirmed physical condition. It's called hematohydrosis, and I'm sure I butchered that, but hematohydrosis. Sweating blood can occur in a person who's suffering extreme levels of stress. So this is not an error. Jesus is enduring an unbelievable amount of stress right here. He's experiencing the physical, emotional, and spiritual toll of everything going on. Jesus is in agony. And this week, as I was preparing this and writing these words, I, just, I felt this immense compassion for Jesus. What Jesus was experiencing here in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is before the cross. This is the lead-up to the crucifixion. And I just want to plead with us this morning, may we not be indifferent or callous or just shrug our shoulders to the suffering of Jesus here. Now, there's a lot of suffering that's happened throughout human history. There's a lot of suffering that's happening right now in this very moment in our world, a lot but I truly believe there's no other singular moment in human history that was as tragic or horrific in suffering as the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And the reason for this, it wasn't only the physical, the emotional elements of the crucifixion, which was horrible in itself, but Jesus would take on the wrath of God for all the sins of humanity. The wrath of God, the punishment for all sins, which no other person in human history has experienced. And this level of suffering is beyond anything we can understand or comprehend. And this moment, or this morning, I want to invite us into a deeper level of compassion for Jesus, a greater heart for Christ a heart that truly appreciates what Jesus did for us, a heart that's more tender and empathetic toward Jesus. 
And I pray the Holy Spirit right now would give us more compassion, give us more empathy, and that we would just be so incredibly grateful. We just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the agony and the suffering that you went through for me, for us. Verse 39, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus is alone. He's all by himself now. And he falls to the ground. Picture this. Bow down. Face to the dirt. And ask out of desperation, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. The cup of suffering. In his anguish, Jesus is crying out to God, Father, is there any way we can switch up the plan here? Can we call another play? Call an audible. This is a desperate cry from Jesus to the Father. God, isn't there another way? But how Jesus ends this prayer is so important. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Father, I really want the cup of suffering to be taken away. Father, I really want for there to be another way, yet, not as I will. Father, I will let go of my will, what I really want, not as I will, but as you will. It's a prayer of surrender. Surrender. It's a prayer of letting go and completely putting everything into the Father's hands. See, Jesus lays it all on the table before God in his agony, in his desperation, but he commits himself to surrender to God's will. Not as I will, but as you will. Throughout military history, when one side knows it's defeated, knows they can't keep fighting, that they need to stop, what do they do? They raise the white flag. The white flag is a symbol of surrender. I'm done fighting. To follow Jesus, we raise the white flag before God and tell him, I'm done with living life for myself. To follow Jesus, it's putting an end to my will, my way. Spiritual surrender is the rightful defeat of self-will in exchange for God's will. The Apostle Paul would say it like this in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when Paul writes about being crucified and not living here, he's still alive. He's still breathing. He's not talking about his physical life here. He's talking about his life centered on himself. His self-will has been crucified to live for Jesus, to live for the way of Jesus. To surrender is to exchange my will for God's will. And there's no doubt about it. This is not easy. It's costly. There's a price to be paid to raise the white flag of surrender. But too often, we're still stuck in our own ways. Too often, we're still living life for self. And I believe there is agony and suffering and clinging to our own way, whether we see it or experience it, because we're missing out on the good that's available in surrender, which we'll look at next. Verse 42. 
he went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. So Jesus is beginning to let go of thinking there might be another option, another play in the playbook. He's accepting the plan. And he recommits himself to the Father's will. He says at the end of verse 42, May your will be done. Now these words should be familiar to us. Jesus taught his disciples to pray this very thing in Matthew 6. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. This is part of the very prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And Jesus shows us here in the Garden of Gethsemane that prayer isn't just verbal rhetoric. Prayer isn't just talk. Prayer is lived. Prayer is demonstrated in one's life. See, it's one thing to pray for God's will to be done when you're enjoying your morning cup of coffee in peace at home or you're on vacation. It's another thing to pray, God, may your will be done in the suffering, in the dark moments of your life, in the agony, the confusion, the pain this life brings. But Jesus did it, though. Jesus shows us the way the way of surrender to God's will in the agony because Jesus knows the secret. The secret is, are you ready for it? It's actually very simple. The secret is God's will is better than my will. So let that sink in for a moment. The truth is that God's will is always better than my will. So when we pray, God, may your will be done, we are acknowledging this truth. God, I trust that your will is better than mine. That's why even in the darkest moments, it is good. And it is best for us to learn to surrender to God's will because God's will is always better. Now, if you're listening and thinking at this point, well, I'm not sure about this whole surrender thing. I think we need to understand that we practice surrender all the time, more than we probably realize it. So when you go to the doctor, you're surrendering to someone who knows better about the human body than you do. You're yielding. You're deferring to the doctor's expertise. It is a form of surrender. When you go to your mechanic, because you can't fix your car on your own, you're acknowledging, I need help from someone who knows better than I do, you're surrendering to your mechanic. When you go to your financial advisor, you acknowledge you need counsel and guidance from an expert who knows more than you do. You're surrendering to their wisdom. We surrender to others all the time. So when it comes to our lives, our future, why would we not surrender to God? Surrender to the one who knows best. Surrender to the one who knows us the best. Surrendering to God is a wise and a good way to live. So even throughout this process with our church and discerning the future, the elders, the leaders, many of you have been praying for God's will to be done. God, show us what you want. Now, we might not like the outcome, the conclusion, but we have sought after the will of God together. And we need to learn to trust God even in the hardness, the ending of our church, that God knows what he's doing. God has a plan that's beyond our understanding. And there is agony in this. There is sorrow. But we hold on to and we keep praying God, not our will, but yours be done. Jesus shows us in the agony we can surrender. And in the surrender, we can find freedom 
and joy when it comes to trusting God, when we yield to God's plans. So imagine you're taking a trip and you have your flight booked, you arrive at the airport, and you make it through security, which is always so stressful to go through security. You finally make it to the gate, you're kind of relieved you made it to the gate, and all of a sudden, you hear your name paged on the intercom. Paging Bill Mayer. Bill Mayer, please come to the gate. And for all of us, when we hear our name in, paged in a moment like that, what would you do? You'd be stressed, right? You'd be freaking out, like this is not a good thing. We're always thinking worst case scenarios first. So you go to the, the counter at the gate and you talk to the flight attendant and she tells you, you know, this flight is not booked. We're actually going to upgrade you from economy to first class. And you're thinking, man, this has never happened to me. This is my day. And you get on that plane and you sit down in this spacious seat with more leg room. They come around with drinks even before the flight takes off. You don't just get a bag of pretzels. You get a nice meal. It's the best flight you have ever taken. You enjoy all the comforts and luxuries of first class. Well, what happened? You got an upgrade. You got something better. God's will is better than our will. God's will is an upgrade over our will. So when we surrender to God and his will, there's actually joy that is possible. Even if we don't feel it all the time, we can hold on to this truth by faith. God's will is better than my will. I really enjoy listening to worship music. I listen to a lot of different worship artists. One guy I've been listening to recently is Pat Barrett, who actually wrote the song Build My Life, which we sang earlier this morning. And I stumbled upon his latest song. It's called Better Hands. And the lyrics of this song just fit the point that I'm trying to make. He says this in his song, Better Hands. Don't want to get ahead of myself. Don't want to go my own way. Because when I go my own way, I always fall short. Been learning how to let it go. I'm learning how to trust you. Because every time I trust you, I'm never more sure this is in better hands. This is a better plan. This is in better hands than my own. And these lyrics speak about surrender. Letting go of my way for God's way. And when you surrender, you acknowledge this is in better hands. Things in God's hands are always better, that God has a better plan. There is joy when we discover and embrace this truth. To surrender whatever it is into God's hands. God's future plans are better than our own. Jesus showed us the way, the way of surrender, the way of trusting that God's will is better than my will. And I want to encourage us that this life of surrender to God, it's a daily thing. This is an everyday thing. It's not just a Sunday morning thing. It isn't just that moment a long time ago when you surrendered your life to Jesus, when you understood what he did on the cross for you. That was the first surrender in what should be a lifetime of moments surrendering to Jesus. Surrender is at the very core of what it means to follow Christ. To every day surrender to Jesus in the small things, in the little things. Choosing, I'm going to go Jesus' way over my way. And then surrendering to Jesus in the big things. God, I want your way. I want your will. And I believe, honestly, there's a call from God to all of us right now to surrender to God's will in what's happening with our church. And again, that's not denying the agony. It's not denying the sorrow. 
We need to grieve. We need to acknowledge the difficulty of all this. But there's an opportunity for us to wave the white flag of surrender to our own wills and trust that God knows what he's doing. Trust that God's will is better. And I know what makes the future so hard is the unknown of the future. That's the challenge of surrender. You're letting go of the known for the unknown. And I want to encourage you in the unknown future to look back. Look back and remember how God has been faithful in the past. As God has been faithful in the past, he will be faithful into the future. In all the unknowns, all the changes, we cling to the one who does not change. The one who is constant. The one who is our rock. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus is our constant. Jesus is the one we can trust in all the unknowns. We can surrender to Jesus because he's good, because he's in charge. He knows what he's doing. Jesus' way is better. I came across this beautiful prayer from Teresa of Avila. She's a famous woman in church history, I think like the 15th, 16th century. This prayer is a prayer of surrendering to God's will. Lord, grant that I may always allow myself to be guided by you. Always follow your plans and perfectly accomplish your holy will. Grant that in all things, great and small, today and all the days of my life, I may do whatever you require of me. Help me to respond to the slightest prompting of your grace so I may be your trustworthy instrument for your honor. May your will be done in time and in eternity by me, in me, and through me. Amen. I want to just us to go to a time of prayer now. And I want to read this prayer again and let you kind of linger over this prayer kind of quietly for a little bit, and then I'll close us in prayer. So let's pray. Lord, grant that we may always allow ourselves to be guided by you. Always follow your plans and perfectly accomplish your holy will. Grant that in all things, great and small, today and all the days of my life, we may do whatever you require of us. Help us to respond to the slightest prompting of your grace so we may be your trustworthy instruments for your honor. May your will be done in time and in eternity by us, in us, and through us. So just take some time to surrender to God with whatever you're carrying right now. Put it all in his hands.
God, I think part of our struggle with surrender is we get so focused on what we're surrendering that we forget who we're surrendering to. Because when we're remembering, we're surrendering to God who knows us, who loves us with an unfailing love, a God who has good plans for our lives on earth and into eternity. We remember that we're surrendering to you. It changes things. So help us right now in the call to surrender, to remember who you are. And Jesus, we thank you for your steadfast endurance for us. We thank you for your faithfulness to go to the cross for us. Because you settled the deal on our greatest problem. You paid our sin debt that we couldn't pay on our own. And because of what Jesus has done, we have forever hope. We have eternity with you and with one another. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all praise, all honor. We pray this in Jesus' name.